Good evening and welcome to our survey of church history called The Church's Story. This is a new series we are doing for the spring semester and we're going to do 12 lessons looking at a survey from the time of Jesus and the Apostles all the way through the 20th century. So we'll be covering um, all of that period in just a short time. So it will be some of it will just be snippets here and there, but I think it will give us a great sense for the history of the church over the ages. So welcome. Um, we're going to use a video series taught by Dr. Keith Stangland, a professor of historical theology from the Center for Christian Studies. And uh, Dr. Stangland is a professor that I had when I did my master's um, and I took his class on. Um, church history, and he's a great teacher, and so we'll just be enjoying that and then supplementing with our discussion. So I'm going to go ahead and watch the video now. Well, what did you all think of Dr. Sanglin's introduction um, to the idea of studying church history? Anyone have any, like, you know, he began with that opening. What do you think of when you think of history? What do you think of when you think of tradition? What came to mind as he asked those questions? Laura, I saw a grin. You must have had some thoughts. Oh, you're muted, though. I was actually thinking about when he asked about the Middle Ages. And, uh, you know, the first word that came to my mind was dirty. <laughs> I was thinking plague. <laughs> no, yeah. Plague, yeah, yeah, death, the death and dirt, and and uh, yeah, massive illiteracy, right? Yeah, yeah, and so um, I think maybe some of that is a, pro a, a product of the of the later age looking back and not maybe completely accurate. You know, obviously, I don't think literacy is what it is now in Europe, but but maybe there's some, you know, some difference from what we um, traditionally think of. Yeah. What else? Anyone have any um, <laughs> resistance to the study of history from school <laughs> experiences past? Uh, <clears throat> I was going to say I actually got a, a bachelor and a master's in history, so. <laughs> oh. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, I often have to defend or get eye rolls when I, you know, tell people that's what I studied. And, um, you know, I just think about teachers that, you know, said, yes, we're going to study dates and, you know, people. But the real question is, so what? You know, what what comes after learning about that? And I think to me, it's for me, history is so interesting because it's a study of people and people's lives. And, you know, those people had the same feelings and thoughts and, you know, needs that I had, but their situations were so different. And how did they get through that? So I think to me, I can understand why sometimes history might be boring <laughs> if you don't delve any deeper than just this happened and then this happened and then this happened, you know, yeah. so. And this particular series is not really geared towards na names and dates and this happened, this happened, this happened, because we're covering such a long period over such a, you know, relatively, you know, just 12 lessons. And um, like that lesson was 30 minutes there. They run from 18 to 38. Like they're all pretty short, you know, so and it's 2000 years. <laughs> so so we're, we will not be doing like the, you know, the sequence of wars and battles and, you know, we're not going to memorize the Roman emperors or, you know, <laughs> it's it's different than that. But it is, we do get a sense of what would the church was like and the experience of the church in these various ages. Yeah. Maybe I so, just... Go ahead. Maybe I just had decent history teachers. I was never like, yay, history class, but... I always found it interesting just because, you know, you question like, well, how do we end up here? 
why are we doing this? And really when you're looking at history, you're looking at how you got here. Uh, one of the most interesting things for me was studying the, um, uh, I can't think of it, uh, the rev not the revolution, um, the industrial age, because you're going from this medieval state of being in a very short period of time to, you know, the groundwork for where we are today. And mm -hmm. it's a, it's, it's a very tight little area in which that occurs. So I don't know. I always enjoyed history a little bit. Well, good. <laughs> very good. <laughs> well, um, I thought, uh, you know, uh, Keith opened with a couple of passages from scripture. And so I want to read two and look for the word tradition in both of them. Will someone read Colossians 2.8 to start? Colossians 2.8. Colossians 2.8. Anyone who has that can just go ahead. Bethany, do you have your Bible handy? I do. I'm trying to find it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Would you mind? I've got it. Reading it? Okay, oh, you've got it? Go ahead, please. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Okay, so we notice the word tradition is in this verse, and was that positive or negative? Negative, because he's talking about human tradition. Yeah, it's this idea that um, you would be going uh, with, along with kind of the empty practices of the world or um, empty um, priorities of the world by going along with tradition here. And then let's turn over to 2 Thessalonians 2.15, and I'll do that one. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Okay, so when we look at this one, positive or negative? Positive. Yeah, and he even um, sort of just breaks it down into two different kinds of traditions. So what are the two kinds of traditions mentioned here? Mm -hmm. Oral tradition and written tradition. Okay. okay. Yeah. So oral and written. So Paul has visited them and he's writing back to them. He's saying, I told you things in person and that is authoritative for the church. And I told you things by letter and that's authoritative. And I want you to follow both of those. And so we have this idea of the importance of tradition in the church and where that authority comes from. It comes from the word of the apostles and from the writings of the apostles as they represented what Jesus taught. And so we're gonna see that idea come about. It'll um, figure prominently in the next section of history that we look at, which will be early Christianity, basically um, from Jesus to about 311, um, which is when Christianity, uh, uh, a major persecution ended with an edict of toleration that legalized Christianity. So that that beginning period of early Christianity is what we're going to look at starting next week. And actually, we'll, we'll spend three weeks on that, uh, looking at the writings that we have from that period, at the persecution that went um, through the church over that time period, and then at the doctrinal developments. And by developments, I really don't mean changes. I mean um, getting more specific so that we can just clarify, oh, this is what the apostles 
apostles always taught. So the doctrinal work that the church did over that period. So we see the idea of traditions can be negative when it's the wrong traditions or positive when it's the right traditions. And we'll be following that theme as we go through the whole course. Um, what objections to studying church history have you heard? Have you experienced any of the the ideas that that um, he referred to? I've heard of churches refusing to have Bible studies. Uh, just to, like getting together for a Bible study as opposed to like a small group or like the tradition of having a traditional Bible study because somehow that was exclusive. Interesting. You know, I, when you first said it, I was like, I've never heard of that. But now that I think about it, I have heard of churches who felt like it was too churchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like that the tradition of the church because it has gone along with some bad behavior of the church has somehow been tainted in a way that we just want to step away from it and do something new so that we aren't acting like these church people over here that we don't like how they're acting is mm -hmm. that capture that's exactly so yeah i i think and we could kind of apply that to all of church history, right? I mean, none of us want to be the people who did the Spanish Inquisition, you know, we, we don't want to be, we don't want to be, um, oh, you know, the crusaders who sacked the very city they were supposed to be rescuing. There have been, um, terrible things that have happened and we think how can we not be that and so yeah maybe trying to step away from our history is an effort to escape some of those mistakes that's a good point any other objections or resistance or reasons you've seen to ignore church history i've definitely been in churches that are less comfortable with um, studies that are based in the Old Testament, oh. the Old Testament um, as opposed to the New Testament, because, you know, the, the depiction of God and is sometimes very different and startling and not necessarily um, applicable. Yeah, there's a lot to wrestle with sometimes when we look at the way things went in the Old Testament and the, and the behaviors that it seems that God endorsed that then that is something we go like, well, is it always is this the same God? And we'll see that the early church really had to struggle with that question. You know, we struggle with it today and they were struggling with it even then. Yeah. And so there's that idea of like, do if we just break ties with the past, it's, I think that's another version of can we escape um, difficult history by just breaking ties with the past. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think um, while I hadn't really thought of um, our culture as just liking what's shiny and new, I thought that was a good point we do sort of want to look to the future sometimes and not to the past um, to probably to our detriment um, and then there's that idea of like if we can just do it the way they did it in the bible everything will be fine and we can leave all that in between behind right but what i what I found in studying church history is that that's an illusion because a lot of what we do is based in history and I didn't even know it. Um, it comes from our history um, and I only learned it while studying. So, yeah. Any other comments on that? Um, I, I just really enjoyed uh, in the video when he was talking about how when we come across a problem in the church, we don't need to reinvent the wheel every single time. This idea that like, 
the church has been dealing with these issues for a long time. Why not see how the church dealt with this in the past? Did they, did it succeed in that situation? You know, what might they have done differently? What could we do now? I think that's just so helpful to think we don't have to think of a brand new solution every single time we come across a problem because I'm sure someone has dealt with this before. Yeah, and we have this wealth of writings over centuries that most of us don't read. So, but maybe, maybe these passages have been discussed. Maybe there's wisdom in that that we can draw on. Yeah. Great, great point. What spoke to you the most about, you know, he gave us five um, reasons, um, blessings out of studying church history. What, what spoke to you out of those? wrote down perspective and that's a word that keeps is chasing me around right now and um you know we always assume that our perspective is the right one and often we don't even think there's another one or if if there is they're wrong but I hadn't really thought of it as you know the perspective of people you know 200 years ago on the bible is certainly as valid as what we think you know, my perspective now and yeah. how much can be learned from that. Yeah. Interpretation of scripture, dealing with um, issues with regard to the church and society. Like there's all of these different things that we have a wealth of, of, of perspective on. Yeah. To piggyback off of what Paige said, I, I found it very interesting talking about the pendulum oh sure and, and how things shift back and forth and recognizing that and and seeing where you are in that swing and encouraging it fighting it a little bit yeah seeing um it it changes our perspective if we see an issue as something that has a pendulum right that some, that has been treated at one extreme and another wow i only saw this slice of where we are right now but i now i can see an entire range of ways that there this has affected the church or that people have viewed this issue or yeah yeah even even recognizing some things as pendulum swings can be um insightful yeah well what is the did you hear the phrase this uh, i have listened to this video several times now because of preparation and then i watched it yesterday and today and my think my favorite um, phrase in it had, was the phrase critical reverence um, what does that mean to you what do you what do you think that he meant by that idea of critical reverence um i think it's just the idea of you know looking back at how you know early fathers or how other christians have seen things and being respectful of that and but also not just taking it you know as as the truth or the word or whatever you know thinking about those people in the time that they lived in and how they might have viewed certain things that we today would view very differently but not just then saying oh well we'll just push that aside but you know looking at it in a respectful light but not just taking it at face value i think yeah both sides of that go ahead what what it reminds me of is the current trend of, you know, we can't respect the founding fathers because they were slave owners. And it's like, well, but that's focusing very narrowly on one aspect of this person. And I'm not saying slave ownership is okay. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying that we can still take value from some of the other parts of their life. We don't have to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. We can choose, you know, we're critical of this part, but we can revere this part. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's, at speaking of pendulums, I think that's a pendulum that has swung very far and I'm hoping it's on its way back, but we'll see, you know, maybe it goes farther than I thought it did. 
Yeah, this and it, I possibly it goes far one direction because it had gone to uncritical reverence in the other direction and the reaction against that sort of deifying a group of people. And then we go like, hey, wait, these people uh, did things that we don't admire too. Um, and so, yeah, trying to hold both of those attitudes at once is hard. And a lot, a lot of times I think our society is not good at it to be able to, um, be critical and be um, admiring of the same person or era or phenomena, whatever it is. You know, um, Dr. Sangler mentioned Luther, uh, who did, you know, some amazing things and some really rotten stuff. You know, and can we can we hold both of those intention and be reverent and critical. Yeah. yeah. It, it really comes down to really listening to what happened, what people taught, what people said, and, and thinking for yourself about it. Yes, this happened. Here are the reasons for doing it. I may not, I may not understand, or I may not agree with it, but I understand why they were doing this in this point in time. Yeah. Or even, gosh, I don't understand why they were doing this at this point in time, but I am guessing that there was a reason, you know, mm -hmm. instead of just jumping straight to condemnation to saying like, hey, maybe I want to investigate and try to understand how this came to be, um, would be a point of growth, I think, for us to do. Mm -hmm. Well, what um, uh, I'd love to get some comments on just what you hope to get out of this study as we go forward. Anything? Is there anything um, that you really any ideas, time periods, information, attitudes that you're looking for or hoping for? I think being raised, going to church all my life because my parents, my grandparents did the thing thing this way with the study of church history, we will see the reason why our father, girl brothers believed what they believed. Yeah, yeah, why and how, how did they get there? Yeah, exactly. Great. I personally, I have a, a an interest in seeing the transition from early Christian church to what becomes the Roman Catholic church, just growing up in it. Like, how did it get so, because it, a lot of what the Roman Catholic church practices, while it's tradition in a lot of ways, it's, it's very well-intended at times and very beautiful. It's also a lot of times doing what Jews were doing in my in my view where they're putting all these roadblocks all these hoops that you have to jump through and it's it's really not complicated so how did we how did they get to that point how did it develop to being such a complicated thing yeah. When we look at the Roman Catholic Church today or the the Western Church of the Middle Ages um, and compare it to the the sense we have of the church in the New Testament, it does. I mean, there's some whiplash there, right? It doesn't um, it's it, the connection is hard to see. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about that as we go along. Yeah. I don't know if we'll get in deep enough to really make sense of that in this brief <laughs> survey. <laughs> There's a lot. But we can always stuff. keep digging. <laughs> a lot of stuff to cover. Yeah, it is. Anything else? Well, I, I just keep thinking of the difference between, you know, Western civilization. I mean, I think we all took Western Civ in college. 
and I barely made it through Western Civ because, oh my word, who cares? Uh, <laughs> but I versus, didn't. But okay, keep going. <laughs> versus a couple of courses I took. I took one on the history of World War One and World War Two. Completely fascinating. Just this little sliver of time. And then I took another one on Tudor and Stuart England. A bigger sliver of time, but also very narrow. And those were fascinating. So, yeah. um, but in the past, when I've tried to um, watch videos on church history, I've not been very attentive. So I'm hoping I'm going to do better this time. Because well, I also have, combining it with discussion helps. Yeah, I also have a bachelor's degree in history, which is why I shouldn't admit that I hated Western Civ as badly as I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay I my didn't... narrow slice of history was sociology of the 60s and it really mm -hmm. was it was called sociology but it was a history class mm -hmm. boy that was fascinating i bet it was yeah but no western sip i don't know i didn't take that so you, you were i guess blessed in my <laughs> so i guess you're what you're hoping to get out of it is an overall sense but one that still feels engaging and i hope we can do that yeah well this has been a great discussion i really appreciate everybody's participation um i think um I i'm looking forward to it i hope that we will be able to develop um sort of a, a general sense of the progression over this this big period of time. You know, it would be neat to do a, a slice, right? But this is the survey course, so this is the big period of time. And I hope that we'll be able to not only kind of get a sense of the progression of events, but get a feel for how the church, um, how the church developed, both how it changed and the really core of truth that stayed consistent through the persecutions, through divisions, through um, controversies, and even um, into today where we have this proliferation of denominations, right, and different church traditions, and yet there, there truly is a core of Christian belief that is common to all of us. Um, and that is one of the most encouraging things that I got out of my church history course is that that um, that that basic um, fundamental statement of belief has been, you know, the church has been true to that with all its faults over the centuries. And um, the beauty of that and the beauty of uh, having that common core in the church today. So I'm be looking forward to it and I will see you next week when we will look at the church fathers, um, this the period of the sub apostolic church, meaning the the disciples of the apostles, the next generation and their writings. Thank you so much. And I'm going to stop the recording so that we can do our prayer time.